Okay, so uh, today we're going to talk not just about what memory leaks are, but also about how we can avoid them, prevent them, and uh, ultimately fix them if they do pop up. So uh, for those of you who are new to this topic, uh, I think that uh, most of you do have some rudimentary grasp on memory management. So uh, let's, let us just uh, do a quick, uh, uh, let us just do a, a quick uh, quiz over here. So uh, those of you who have encountered a memory leak in production, can you please uh, send me a plus in the chat? Hmm, a lot of people, but uh, by far not everyone. And uh, that's how I can tell that uh, we are all Java developers. If uh, this was a C++ talk, then everybody would, would have given a plus. <laughs> and uh, that's of course, because uh, Java helps us a lot in terms of automating memory, memory management. But uh, that doesn't mean that we can't screw up and shoot ourselves in the foot. So let's uh, do a quick rundown of our agenda. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to uh, do a quick intro and a definition of what a memory leak is. Then we are going to discuss in detail what types and common uh, patterns and causes of memory leaks there are in Java applications. And then we will discuss uh, the mitigation strategies and ways to avoid or fix memory leaks. So I uh, once again thank Arthur for an introduction, so I can skip this part. You already know who I am. So what is a memory leak? So a memory leak is a type of a, is a kind of a resource leak. A resource leak in general is uh, a situation where you allocate some resource, use it, but then you don't deallocate it or free it up when you are done with it. So it just remains there hanging around and doing nothing but taking your computing or storage resources. And this applies to memory leaks as well. So uh, in Java, all the objects that are no longer in use are getting deleted by the garbage collector, obviously. But in case there is a strong reference somewhere in the heap remaining to this object, then there is a high chance of this object not being deleted, unless it's a circular reference, but that's uh, a topic for another day. So basically, uh, if you have some unused memory, some objects that are left hanging around after you use them, and uh, there are still strong references to them, then garbage collector won't delete them, and they will remain in use. They remain, remain in your heap. They will uh, keep taking up resources. So on this graph, you can see basically uh, how uh, this looks. So um, as you can see, the intersection between a uh, referenced object and a uh, referenced object and unused object is called a memory leak. So memory leaks can uh, be, uh, they, they are sort of like cancers. So they can be benign or they can be malign. A benign memory leak doesn't grow. So you just have some unused objects remaining uh, that you forgot to clean up and they take up space, but uh, they don't produce any more data. And therefore uh, it's just a certain part of your heap 
that you are no longer able to use because it's taken up by the uh, leaked object. A malign memory leak, on the other hand, grows, and this can grow until the application crashes because it runs out of memory. So uh, let's see what types causes, what kind of code smells, what kind of patterns can there be that can lead to a memory leak. So uh, most common causes, most common uh, places where a memory leak can be found are some sort of global state collections, especially maps. Uh, there are memory leaks that can be caused by uh, improper implementation of the equals and hash code method. There can be memory leaks or even other resource leaks caused by, mm, by resources not being closed properly. There are also potential problems with the uh, non-static inner classes and thread locals. So let's look at each uh, type in detail. Starting with the most common one, the misuse of static fields and global collections. So as you may know, the static field is not bound to a certain instance or class. Instead, it's bound to the class itself. So if there is some sort of static field, then it's not going to be deallocated when any, any of the instances of this class are deallocated because uh, it is uh, always referenced by the class. And uh, unless the class itself is getting unloaded, this instance will remain in memory. So this is a prime place to run into a memory leak because if you have a static object, especially if it's some sort of collection that can grow uh, or other type of mutable data, like say a shared byte buffer. So those types of things can get out of hand pretty quick. Uh, in terms of like where uh, do this, does this stop being a problem? I think that the cutoff for this is the use of constants. So we often do use constants as uh, static final fields, but the expectation is that constants don't have state. They only have a value that doesn't change. So a constant can be a, cannot be a mutable collection, for example. So in case of constants, I wouldn't necessarily call it a memory. But uh, when we are, having like say a global globally shared uh, hash map that is used for some sort of ad hoc cache. Well, uh, this hash map can grow way large, very fast, and it can actually be a kind of memory leak in of itself because uh, let's say we are writing a lot of values to this cache and we are not pruning the ones that we don't use anymore. So there are ways around it, like say uh, having a, a maximum capacity and implementing cache cleanup strategies, like say LFU cache or LFU cache. But overall, uh, I've seen this anti pattern many times when people do use uh, hash maps for caching, they share them between components and uh, those caches are basically never cleaned up. So this can be, can lead to a memory leak, especially when, uh, when designing any sort of, any sort of cache, you need to consider whether you are going to reuse any of the keys. Otherwise it's uh, simply not worth it. Because if uh, there are no keys on this cache, then it's simply a waste of your space, of your uh, storage resources. So uh, the conclusion that we can make from that is uh, don't uh, do ad hoc caching. Use caching libraries. Use uh, caching sparingly and use it where it's appropriate, so where you can have uh, high selectivity on your keys and you can actually achieve those cache sheets. 
static fields in general are bad practice unless they're used for constants. Uh, and same goes for like uh, large shared buffers of bytes or whatnot. So uh, all state should be scoped. Otherwise, it can get uh, it, it it can be globally referenced, and in that case, it can lead to it never being deallocated. So, any questions here? Looks like there are none. So let's proceed. So mm, another kind of okay, common. Uh, we have uh, one question. Uh, what about leaks inside Lambda? Well, I will discuss those when we are going to talk about inner classes. Okay. Lambdas are kind are a sort of like anonymous classes in some regards. And of course, if someone wants to add something to my list, I am always appreciative of any input during the presentation. So uh, let's uh, proceed. So the most common problem is uh, hash maps that can be it can cause memory leaks is actually something that's uh, very common, but uh, is actually very bad. And it's the use of mutable keys. So as per the equals hash code contract, two objects that are equal should have the same hash code. And this is what's been used in uh, all of the hash table like data structures, such as hash map or concurrent hash map or whatever. So this is basically how a hash map looks in, uh, in the, in, from the inside. So it has an, uh, an array of buckets. Each bucket has some sort of data structure, like a linked list or a tree or whatever. And uh, uh, the keys are distributed using their hash code. So when a record is written into hash map in Java. Uh, an entry uh, has a stored cache va cached value of a hash code. And if the hash code of the underlying key changes because some of the mutable fields that uh, are used for hash code calculations change, so if that happens, then the look up by this key will actually find nothing so uh, we will have an entry that cannot be looked up and we have a key that's no longer in use so uh, that's why when you have a mutable uh, a mutable key any mutation to this key can cause uh, problem of unreachable entries. And this is a memory leak. Similar things can happen if in case uh, say uh, equals and hash code contract is violated. So just uh, re enter the presentation mode. Sorry, what?
Okay, so uh, same things can happen if uh, we violate people's hash code, uh, like for example, if we have a situation where two different uh, two, two, two uh, objects that are actually equal have different hash code. And that applies for structure quality. Let's say, for example, that we use some fields and equals, but don't use them in hash code. And uh, the same can happen if we don't implement equals in hash code and just use the, the default implementation from the uh, object class. So in conclusion, let's make our keys immutable. This actually helps us in terms of uh, us being able to actually cache the hash code value. So if the hash code value doesn't change, then we can only we, we can uh, just calculate it once. That's actually what they do in the string class in the Java standard library. So then again, the next type of a memory leak is the one caused by the misuse of inner class. And by inner classes, I mean the I, I mean those that are not static. So a static inner class doesn't have a reference to an instance of an outer class. But uh, a regular inner class, which is not static, it, it actually has references to uh, the to the upper level uh, outer class, and uh, or to be precise to one of its instances. And even if that instance is actually not used anymore, then this, this reference remains for as long as we use the inner class. That's why it's very dangerous to actually uh, to actually send any of the uh, instances of the regular non-static inner class outside of uh, the outer class. Uh, so, if it's scoped within the inner class, within the outer class, it's not a problem. But otherwise, it can lead to a situation where the reference remains, even though it's not explicit, explicitly defined. So because it's implicitly present there. So the same applies to the method local classes that are defined within the method. The same applies to anonymous classes that are defined within methods. And the same applies to lambda expressions that uh, act as closures for variables inside the method. So if uh, there is some sort of reference that uh, actually gets into a lambda expression, let's say from a method parameter, and in this lambda expression, it's used uh, in some capacity. So for as long as there is this lambda expression that uh, encloses this reference, this reference won't be deleted. And this is also a type of memory leak. So uh, for, uh, so Ian, did I answer your question about lambdas? Um, Mikhail, a small question. Uh, did you face that issue uh, in your experience? Uh, uh, I mean, like uh, when this reference caused some huge memory leaks? Well, in case of inner classes uh, or lambda expressions, memory leaks are usually not that huge because uh, um, it's uh, only one reference. It's not like a large collection where you have, have uh, thousands of objects and will be growing. But uh, yeah, uh, I did see some uh, situation where this, that actually became a problem. Like for example, if uh, a lot of, uh, like for example, if we pass a very large collection into a Lambda and this collection is actually uh, very memory heavy. So uh, an object can uh, take up uh, any amount of memory. And uh, sometimes even one leaked reference can cause a big problem. 
and uh, the reference problem is actually contagious. So as long as there is any sort of path to this large object, any sort of path that can be made through strong references, it won't be deleted. And uh, that's why it's often hard to pinpoint the exact uh, moment where uh, memory got leaked. Okay, got it. Okay, so final, the final type I'm going to uh, discuss is actually the one that's caused by the misuse of thread locals. And here I'm going to cite Joshua Block. So he uh, said that sloppy use of thread pools in combination with sloppy use of thread locals can cause unintended object retention, or in other words, memory leak. Uh, but placing the blame on thread locals alone is unwarranted. So the discussion around thread locals that actually prompted Joshua to uh, put this, uh, I believe it was a tweet, but I'm not sure. So uh, the reason he uh, said it is actually because uh, many people started blaming thread locals uh, for a memory leaks in web applications specifically. Uh, if uh, someone doesn't know what's a, what's a thread local. It's basically a wrapper that allows you to have a separate instance of some object uh, or some class per thread. So each thread can have its own isolated state. And in general, that's okay because uh, when the thread is uh, getting disposed of, all of its thread locals are also cleaned up. That's handled by the, uh, the, by the garbage collector. But, and here's a large but, uh, in modern web applications, we often use a threading model that's called thread per request. So for each request, we allocate a separate thread, but we don't actually create a thread. Instead, we take it from a thread pool. And once we are done processing the request, the thread is not getting deleted. Instead, it's being reused. It's being sent back to the thread pool. So in case uh, you have a thread that's managed by a thread pool and you have it create thread locals, then you better make sure you clean them up because otherwise uh, you can have those uh, thread local values hanging around even after you made this request. And uh, it uh, won't be easy figuring out uh, which particular request or which particular thread caused this. And since uh, for many scenarios, like uh, uh, say same user can execute several requests and each request can be allocated to a different thread. Thread locals are also make a bad uh, uh, decision. Are, 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 it, it's also a bad decision to use thread locals for uh, things like session state. So those are to be, uh, are to be globally configured. Somebody asked about code examples. Sorry, don't have any. This presentation was meant for <laughs> speaking in front of live audience. But uh, I think that uh, if you actually do want code examples, I can point you to several places on the internet where you can find them. Although those are quite synthetic. Uh, a real world project uh, uh, like uh, often has uh, problems with memory leaks that are not necessarily caused by your own code. So oftentimes you can have uh, a memory leak that's uh, actually caused by some sloppy coding in some third party library. And those cases are especially hard to Debug because it's not your code. You often uh, have no ability to make any changes to it, and you do have to 
sometimes find workarounds to avoid the particular flow that can lead to a problem like that. Mm. Okay, so we have discussed uh, how we can uh, classify hemorrhagic and what are the common uh, smells we have to look out for. So let's talk about preventing and detecting and fixing and whatever. So uh, first of all, how do you know that you have a memory? So what are the symptoms? Uh, so oftentimes when you have uh, a memory leak that's uh, causing some crashes or say out of memory errors, you can actually detect it by uh, looking at the stack trace of the exit message uh, and also on the exit code 137. So that's the one that's used for uh, specifying that you your process ran out of memory. Another common uh, cause, uh, another common symptom is uh, performance degradation because uh, a lot of GC clauses have to be made uh, as the garbage collector tries desperately to save your application from crashing by running frequent pauses. So uh, frequent pauses can lead to performance degradation and you can actually see them on any of the uh, profilers such as Visual VM, or uh, you can uh, use something like GMH and uh, or GMS and uh, see the garbage collection poses on, uh, say, a Grafana dashboard or any other dashboarding solution. So those can be very useful in identifying like the uh, uh, situations where you might have a memory problem. So let's say don't want to run into memory leaks and I assume I have scared you well enough to, uh, yeah, and I, 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 I see lots of preference and I'll discuss that. So, uh, mm, First uh, part of uh, not getting a memory leak is actually a good having a good code quality process. So that includes uh, code review and static code analysis, uh, which can be done through your IDE, through configurations that can be made team wide through the tools like check style or uh, editor config or whatever. So. Uh, and they can also be done centrally as part of your CI pipeline uh, through the tools like Sonic Cube. So when you're doing a code review, you look out for the empty patterns that I've mentioned in the previous section, and also and also just uh, be careful of any parts of your code that handle state, because as you know, the state is the enemy. So. Another way of uh, actually handling memory intensive workloads is making use of uh, the java.ref package and the soft and weak references. So a soft and weak references are uh, tools that can help you in uh, avoiding having a strong reference where you don't need one. So a weak reference, and this is actually used in a data structure called weak hash map, which is recommended for things like caches. We are returning to caches once again. So a weak hash map, it uses weak references instead of regular ones. A weak reference works like this. If, uh, if there are no other references to the object, but the weak reference, then this object can be deleted via the garbage collector. But until that happens, it's available. So it basically allows a garbage collector to delete unused objects, even though we have uh, references to them. A soft reference is a bit more is a, is a bit more stable because uh, it will remain and it won't be uh, cleaned up by the garbage collector unless 
the, pro the program runs out of memory. So uh, unless you don't have uh, space to allocate new objects, it won't uh, be touched by the garbage collector. But it, uh, in some cases where you don't have this uh, space anymore, the garbage collector can delete a soft reference. Again, if you have any strong reference to the object, uh, they won't be deleted. So, okay. Mikhail, I have a small question as for the last point. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right now, I guess you know there is a lot of uh, cache implementations so where uh, we can specify uh, the strategy, how to cache objects uh, for which time and or uh, which size we, we would like to allocate for the cache. So if it makes sense to still use, uh, for example, weak references uh, for the caches, or maybe there is some special case where it's better to use uh, weak hash map uh, versus uh, some uh, given uh, implementation of the cache. So weak hash map has the benefit of being a part of JDK. So you don't have to add any external dependency to use. Uh, but otherwise I recommend using uh, existing and mature libraries for caches. Um, I can also see a question from uh, Jan Chumak about uh, direct memory leaks caused by, by buffers on safe memory layout. Okay, so those are actually quite uh, uh, quite a huge problem sometimes, especially in uh, things like IO libraries. I believe people from Nike have to deal with those sometimes. So uh, what are those? They are caused by uh, the uh, misuse of unmanaged memory. So unman unmanaged memory or off-heap memory is a part of the memory allocated to the GVM that's not uh, part of the heap that's not uh, garbage collected. Say, for example, a direct uh, M memory mapped file or some sort of uh, native buffer or uh, even something that was uh, uh, done via the unsafe API, the sun is unsafe, even though the, cl the class name says it's unsafe, it will still keep using it. So uh, those can be profiled because, uh, because dashboarding tools uh, do show the off heap memory as well as heap memory. And you can look for a telltale sign of a memory leak. Like for example, uh, like for example, a growing curve of uh, allocations that are not clean, getting cleaned up or things like out, out of memory error or 167 exit code. So, but they are harder to uh, actually identify because uh, those are not objects on the heap. Uh, those cannot be hooked up in, say, a visual VM. Instead, you have to uh, basically go through the code and see uh, where, you, uh, where do you work with those direct buffers and make sure they go they are getting cleaned up properly. So. Uh, let me see if there are, if, if there are any more questions. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Vladislav Kapaniev said that uh, I would probably add that the cache map is better to use for cache only. Only if lifespan of the cache entry can be limited uh, by the strong reference lifespan. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, if... Uh, we actually don't have strong reference anymore, then we can say that safely say that this uh, key is not needed anymore. But uh, in most cases, I think that things like uh, LRQ cache are preferable because uh, it uh, can sometimes get unpredictable about, well, about uh, like uh, what we actually do need to use or don't need to use. Uh, 
because the crash hit can happen. Uh, even after a few GC cycles have passed. But yeah, for canonical caches, the weak hash map is actually something that we can use. Hello. Uh, I have a question, one question about as a complex case when we need to find where is the memory leak? So, for example, the real situation we have several login logout session of users. It was based on my real experience on production, but the memory consumption is uh, high and high, and memory is consumed. And uh, for example, no, it is uh, it is seems that uh, it seems that uh, memory is not freed after users log out. So, how to do? how to do this investigation maybe you have some advices or some best practices how to do this investigation when we don't have um, for example we don't have some strange pieces of code we don't have any smells of code we just have production code but we definitely have memory leak in it how to find it using the set of memory dumps because we have for example we have set series of memory dumps for example taken each each hour and uh, we see that memory is uh, memory consumption is still high and memory is not free how to find which which classes are which objects of which classes are not free so how to uh, make a deep investigation in complex case Maybe you so to... well a, a good a good a good place to start is actually using some of the tools that are available like for example profilers monitoring tools uh, in uh, things like visual vm you can actually see uh, what kinds of objects are taking up memory so uh, down to exact classes in uh, cases that you where you can't uh, attach a visual vm or uh, attach a memory profiler you can let's say it's a production environment and you just can't do that you can use things like uh, runtime flags, like you can uh, enable verbose garbage collector output through the verbose uh, uh, GC, GC, uh, GC flag, and uh, uh, it actually outputs in the standard output the uh, the uh, information on what objects are being allocated and deallocated about GC poses and things like that. Um, in most cases that I've encountered in the real case, the real the real ones, uh, the problems with the garbage collection or with memory leaks are caused by shared state. So look out for shared state in the application or in the library that you're using. And uh, see what, what uh, can, uh, what, what uh, kinds of objects can actually remain persisted in, uh, can actually remain in, in memory uh, between requests and in between the request response cycles if we are talking about web application so in most web applications the allocation pattern is like this you receive requests you allocate some objects you process it and those objects are getting deallocated there shouldn't be anything remaining between those cycles and if there is and you can see that uh say uh, GC output says that you have uh, you have uh, uh, such and such objects allocated, but you don't see the message about them being deallocated. Then this is probably where you have your memory. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, Jan Chimak, also thank you for uh, for that link. Uh, memory analyzer tool, yeah, uh, it's uh, 
are actually something that uh, I've seen being used. Mm, but I am uh, more familiar with the memory profilers. Like say your kit and J profiler, they both have memory profiling options. Yes, thank you. In my in my cases, uh, we solved this problem because we uh, actually we spend a lot of time, but we carefully compare each each memory dump one object by object, and we saw that some objects are still available, but they should be not be available by strong reference after uses logout. But we definitely uh, compare heap dumps by each object. For example, we have several thousands of objects, several thousands of lists of uh, links and maybe all, most of all we carefully manually check around <laughs> each time <laughs> and we found that some objects actually we don't have proper procedure of logout <laughs> in this case so that's why sometimes it is very very complex to find out uh, where is memory leak and what was the culprit in your case that's not a secret uh, the problem is that actually we don't have uh, a uh, uh, good procedure for users logout. One of the objects was actually not clean, was not set to now after users logout. So some piece of, it was a stateful application and some pieces of user se session was still in memory after users logout. So logout procedure was incomplete. Actually, we need to set up several objects to now, but it was absent this code. So, so it, was, it, it, it was due to session, am I correct? Yes, yes, HTTP sessions, yes, HTTP sessions and Apache Tomcat HTTP sessions. So it was before microservices world. Yeah. And the monster of ancient world. <laughs> here, here it goes. As I said, the state is the enemy. <laughs> at least at least when you have your session in like a, in like a ready instance, you can see the, the, the big, okay. big monstrous application from the ancient world. So mm. thank you. Okay, you're welcome. So uh, let's move on. Uh, mm, so what are some of the common fixes that uh, can uh, help you get out of uh, having your application crash due to memory issues? So uh, one thing, as I said, the state is the enemy, avoid global collections, avoid uh, global static uh, classes or shared data. Then again, uh, hash maps, be especially careful with your hash maps and uh, make your keys immutable and uh, implement the equals and hash code methods and actually put some thought into how you implement them and not just blindly doing uh, auto-generated uh, templates from your ID. I understand that this is boring boilerplate, but uh, sometimes the uh, difference between a good hash code implementation and a bad one can be measured in uh, seconds of your application's responsiveness. Uh, when you use any kind of external resources, make them closable or auto-closable to implement those interfaces and use try these resources construction because uh, that ensures that uh, any resources will be freed up and the calls methods will be called and any errors during, uh, during the closing of the resource will be handled properly. Uh, always uh, prefer static inner classes over non-static ones. And when you're uh, using non-static inner classes or anonymous classes with lambda expressions, keep in mind that uh, they uh, should uh, be uh, they, they should be scoped uh, so that uh, they don't uh, end up uh, so that they don't end up uh, grabbing any of the large objects from the enclosing method or class. And uh, that's why, uh, that's actually why uh, things like a method reference presentation are preferable for them than expressions, because that way you can ensure that you uh, don't 
uh, end up creating a closure. Uh, so, and finally, clean up your thread locals. They uh, do have a, a clear method. So a thread local have a, have a clear method and you can use it in the final block, especially. Uh, uh, this is especially important. So uh, any type of uh, shared resource uh, that can be cleaned up or released like say a lock or a thread local or, uh, or some sort of uh, uh, external resource of stream, they should be closed in the finally block because any sort of ex exception uh, in, the in the course of processing can uh, lead to a situation where you don't actually close it or clear it or whatever. Okay, so overall, what can we conclude from it? Uh, so, uh, always scope your state, uh, always clean up your resources, uh, be mindful of uh, memory heavy workloads and use appropriate types of references for those. And uh, be mindful of uh, uh, things like hash maps because of how hash code works and uh, uh, especially in terms of mutability. So, I believe this is it. Uh, if you do have any questions or uh, any suggestions or anything to add, do feel free to do so.